Hey YouTube, back for part three, which uh, should be the finale for the build at least of the snake cage. But when we last left our hero, these rail parts for the top frame of the thing uh, had their grooves cut and were ready to be glued up, um, but I decided to go ahead and finish them, which maybe you can see um, is done. What I'm just doing right now before I actually glue this whole thing up, I'm taking these back to the shooting board and just taking one swipe across the end to uh, clean off any finish that kind of bled over onto the glue surface and also to make sure that I'm back to a, a dead square exact 45 after any wood movement issues I might have had during the finishing process. A great finish starts with great surface prep. And for my money, you can't beat a sharp smoothing plane for surface prep. Yeah, sandpaper is a necessary evil. You're going to run into places where a plane just won't fit. And sometimes you get grain that won't cooperate. Like even the card scrapers having trouble around this knot. Almost all of my finishes start with some random amount of shellac. This is between a one and a two pound cut, depending on how much alcohol slogs in there. I'm dyeing it with a couple of drops of dark brown trans tint. You may be wondering why I'm putting walnut dye on walnut. Well, it's to help even out the sapwood and the dark wood, and it's also to keep it looking like walnut over the years as the sun fades it. Walnut has a tendency to yellow pretty severely in UV light. I did two coats of shellac to make sure that the boards were completely sealed and that it had taken as much dye as it was going to take, especially the lighter sapwood. There's no need to sand in between coats of shellac because the alcohol will reactivate the underlying coat, but after the second one was completely dry, I smoothed it out with 320 grit paper to get it baby's butt smooth. After I finished sanding, I wiped everything down with a damp paper cloth to make sure I got all the dust off. It's one of the benefits of sealing with shellac is that water won't raise the grain of the pieces, which is good because I'm using a water-based finish here. Snakes have a very, very delicate respiratory system, and I just can't take a chance of anything oil-based off-gassing. These waterborne finishes dry really, really fast, so you have to be careful not to overbrush them. In between coats, I sanded back very, very lightly with 400 grit paper, brushed off the excess dust, and then hit the pieces with the wet paper towel treatment again to make sure they were really, really clean. I did two coats of finish with the clear gloss with the 400 grit sanding in between, and then my final coats of finish were with a semi-gloss to get the sheen that I wanted. If you build all the layers with semi-gloss, you end up with something that looks more like satin or flat because the flatteners that are in it kind of add up. After the top coat is fully hardened, I buffed it out with one of these green scrubby pads that doesn't actually sand the finish down any, it just knocks off the dust nibs. And then my top coat is Johnson's Paste Wax. This doesn't do much for the sheen or the protection, but it does give it a lovely silky touch to the uh, fingers when you run your hands across it. You can see in this last piece how that dye goes a long way towards evening out the sapwood and the hardwood and the walnut. I'm trying to get a good bit of wax down in these slots, um, partially because it's gonna lubricate the aluminum and make it slide better, but honestly, mostly because there is just no other finish down in here. And um, if we do ever decide to put a mister or something on this cage, then um, that's the last place that I want to swell up and change dimensions. So the wax will offer it at least a little bit of protection. I suppose it goes without saying that you don't want to get epoxy in those grooves that you just waxed. So herein lies the beauty of the epoxy. I have plenty of time to get this band clamp on here and to go around and make sure none of these corners have slid and that they all sit flush and that life is just good. Okay guys, well, cutting it close even with the working time of epoxy. Um, this is plenty hard, although still kind of warm. Uh, what happened? Well, someday YouTube will uh, allow swear words, I don't know, without flagging videos, and I can show you how this all went down. But the short version is that these Bessie band clamp corners are great if you have square pieces. If you have a rounded profile on the outside edge, forget it. These are useless. I, I got the thing propped up on some sticks on the corner. I still was not able to get these to stay in place under any kind of tension. So, scrap blocks to the rescue. Fortunately, I have all these corners, triangles, that I cut off of the miters of various things. And uh, they make great pressure blocks. I've got them all around the outside perimeter here. And this is what the band clamp is actually pushing on to pull these corners square. 
The epoxy is not fully cured at this point, but it's far enough along that it's safe to work on the handles slash stiffeners for the aluminum expanded metal. I drilled and countersunk holes through the back piece and into the front. I'm just attaching it with some number eight screws, except for the one that goes on the bottom of the bottom. I didn't leave enough room to put screws in here. So what I'm gonna do is just put a good coat of epoxy on there and then slap the aluminum right down on top of it. The epoxy will expand and ooze around all of the little holes in the aluminum and it'll make a nice tight seal. With the top solo on the bench is a good time to install the lighting. These are self-adhesive LED strips. They're really easy to work with. You can cut them about every three LEDs where they have these copper landing pads. And once you stick them in place, all you have to do is run little jumper wires with the soldering iron from corner to corner and finally to the power. Some of you probably like this better. You can't really see me, but ta-da, LED color changing lights. What every proud snake owner needs. Why you need this in a snake cage is beyond me, but now that I see it here, you totally need this in a snake cage. Okay, with seemingly every small clamp I own pressed into service, this thing is completely together and squared up, and um, frankly, I wish I could just <laughs> use it clamped rather than having to actually assemble it, because this is where things go wrong. But uh, we gotta put some glue and screws and other things in here. So first I'm laying out for the screws. Uh, I don't want to glue this entire thing together because it's just too big and too heavy and frankly there's too much glass which might break someday and have to be replaced. So the top is going to get screwed on in case this sliding mechanism ever gets messed up and the top has to be remade. And the back is going to get screwed on simply so that I can put the whole thing in place and attach the back later uh, rather than having to move it around with this big heavy back on. Uh, the back will also give you access to replace the big piece of glass that goes at the bottom. In order to clear the sliding track grooves, the screws have to go pretty close to the outside edge of the frame. Therefore, pre-drilling is an absolute must. This walnut likes to stick to drill bits, so I had to pull it completely out and uh, use my fingers to get the waste out of the flutes. The countersink is marked with a Sharpie marker to let me know exactly how far I've got to drill so that the screw head is sunk, but not down in a hole. I'm using epoxy on the miters to get the strongest joint possible and also to do a little gap filling if necessary. I added some filler so that this stuff wouldn't just run down the seam. And I also put a drop of trans tint in it just in case it shows. And then there's more fighting with the band clamps, but at least this part of it's got square corners. So the brackets that come with the clamp work fine. Well, that was a royal pain in the butt. However, the joints came together really, really nicely. And I think putting a drop or two of trans tint in the epoxy is gonna end up being a really good move because if there are any little gaps in there, they're gonna be walnut brown and you'll never see them. Because I have all those brass screws attaching the top to the frame, I'm gonna use screws to attach the frame to the base that keeps everything visually balanced, so to speak. I'm putting steel screws in all of these holes for now. That makes sure that they're tapped and bottomed out and that the heads won't snap off the brass ones when I put them in during the final assembly. Just doing my final 400 grit knockdown sanding before I put the last coat of semi-gloss on and then finally the wax. Um, this is also gonna give me an opportunity to touch up any blowout I got from drilling the screw holes and find any screws that need just a little more depth with the countersink. Final finish is the last coat of semi-gloss, which knocks the sheen down just a little bit more. Being pretty careful to put this on with the direction of the grain so it looks as good as possible. Once it dries, I can take the back off and get ready to mount the doors. Doors, of course, need hinges. The ones I'm using are an offset style that get mortised into the door frame itself. That allows them to open a full 180 degrees, um, in this case, down towards the floor. These hinges are pretty easy to locate since they self-square against the bottom of the frame. Once I've got it clamped in place and I'm sure it's not gonna move, I'm gonna run my knife around the outside of it, establishing a nice deep knife wall to mark the outer edges of the mortise that I need for the hinge. To establish the depth I need for the mortise, I'm gonna use a router plane. The hinge itself is the best guide you could have for the depth of the router plane. Once it's set and locked in place with the screw and the obligatory blue tape, I use it almost like a marking knife to scribe the outside line. From here, it's just like chiseling out any other mortise. Once the knife lines are well established, I come in with a big chisel and set them nice and deep, and then a sharp, medium-sized chisel to hog out most of the waste. 
At that point, you can come in with the router plane, establish the mortise at the exact correct depth, and make sure everything is nice and clean. Assuming everything fits as expected, you can come in with some sandpaper, clean up any fuzzies you might have created, dab on a little bit of touch-up finish. In my case, I'm putting it down in the hinge mortise as well and then you can screw the hinge in place. Really, really helps to have a self-centering drill bit to drill the pilot holes and definitely put the screws in by hand because if you split this at this point, you will say bad words. Mounting the doors turns out to be surprisingly easy. My change earlier to leave an inch and a half of spacing around the outside of the door made it so I could prop it in place with two three quarter inch thick pieces of cutoff stock. They happen to be the same miracle triangles I used as uh, my clamp helpers on the top. Once I'm sure the door is exactly where I want it and it's securely clamped in place, the same VIX bit is used to drill the pilot holes and the screws once again are put in by hand. With enough clearance, these hinges will let the door swing a full 180 degrees. The door catches are made out of scrap stock and they get a round over on all surfaces so they're comfortable in the hand. I don't like doing stuff this small on a router table, but it beats doing it with a hand router. Once they're sanded smooth and finished, they get installed with a single screw right in the middle of the door. How tight you screw in that screw determines how tight the latch is. Final phase of the door construction is the installation of the Lexan panels that make the window. I'm using 100% silicone sealant as my quote unquote glue. It holds the acrylic really well, it's waterproof, and once it cures, it's completely non-toxic. Side panels go in the same way. I had to rig up a clamping system to press these into place since I'm not working with gravity like I am with the doors. It turns out I need some longer screws for these things, but otherwise the construction is done. I got all the steel hardware swapped out for the nice pretty brass, and I got the final top coat of uh, paste wax on and buffed out. We're not quite ready for the inhabitant though. I still need to install the piece of glass that goes on the very bottom. I'm gonna wait to do that until I get this thing in place because that piece of glass is very heavy and uh, it's glass, it's a little fragile. And of course I have to do all the environmental controls. I gotta put the heat tape in there, I gotta put the temperature sensors, and I gotta do the Arduino programming to make it all work. That's okay because this thing still needs to sit another 24 or maybe even 48 hours to let that silicone sealant uh, completely cure and quit off-gassing. And you know, to a lesser extent, even the paste wax has a little dissipation to do before it's ready for a snake to live in there. So that's a wrap. Questions or comments, leave them down below. I wasn't planning on filming the Arduino aspects of this because quite frankly, they're exactly the same as this uh, how to control the humidity video that I already did. Uh, but if you specifically wanna see it, you can let me know that down below as well. I'll post a quick update when we get the resident living in here so you can see the whole thing in place and inhabited. But in the meantime, thanks for riding along. And as always, stay safe, YouTube.